Hare Krishna, dear devotees, welcome back to another interview on the importance of reading Srila Prabhupada's books. This is Books are the Basis, organized by the ISKCON Ministry of Education. And we are very happy and also honored to have with us today His Grace Radhika Raman Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna, thank you so much for inviting me, Krishna Prima Rupa Prabhu, to uh, this uh, forum and to say a few words and uh, discuss with you. I'm looking forward to the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, as many devotees will know, Radhika Raman Prabhu is a Vaishnava scholar, author, and editor. And I, I found a very also interesting background. Uh, Prabhu was born or raised in Boise, Idaho, which is a state in the northwest of, of the United States. And Prabhu was uh, raised by devoted parents in a Vaishnava family and also did homeschooling with his younger brother. And, uh, and as I read, uh, it was based, the curriculum was based on the Bhagavad Puran, on the Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, he also studied other subjects uh, and like mathematics, science, and Sanskrit, which I think you liked especially. And, and then very soon, uh, at the age of 13, you enrolled at the Boise State University. Um, and at 17, you received a Bachelor of Arts and Philosophy and Science in Applied Mathematics. And then soon, like at 17, very young, uh, I think it was noted here, the, the youngest student ever who uh, enrolled at the University of Oxford, where you also studied. And you received uh, your master's studies there, study of religion. In 2000, and four years later, you received your doctor of philosophy in Hinduism from the University of Oxford. So that's quite remarkable, uh, such a young age, um, you know, getting a PhD. And then, of course, you, you continue to, to work and research in many different fields. And as I understand today, you're the director of the religious studies program at the Utah State University, is that right? Yeah. And, yes. and of course, I'm sure also engaged in many other uh, aspects of acad academic uh, research and work. And you also, you're an author, you have published uh, also books. Uh, I know the book which you have published together with His Holiness Krishna Kshetra Maharaj on the Bhagavad Purana. Maybe we can also talk about that a little later. But yeah, I'm very excited to talk with you because, you know, like you're a devotee and uh, coming from the academic background, and then we're talking about books. <laughs> so, Prabhupada's books. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for being with us. Um, yes, thank you, Prabhu, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I, I I don't know that the, this thing about the youngest student at Oxford, I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't know how that <laughs> got started, uh, honestly, but uh, Oxford has seen many young students uh, okay. <laughs> before, so so who knows? Uh, but no, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and now actually, I'm I'm no longer director of religious studies. I'm now department head for history, religious studies, and classics. Three faculties. Okay. Um, uh, at the university, so yeah. Thank you for. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, for, I think for many of us, it's it's um, we would like to maybe hear about your upbringing and and having homeschool homeschooling and and then also based on the Bhagavatam, how was I mean that. Because usually I ask, what was your first contact with Prabhupada's books? <laughs> in your case, it was in the childhood, the learning in school, at the home. Would you like to, how was it, what was your interaction with the Bhagavatam? What do you remember from that time? Your yeah, I'd be happy to say a few words about that. Uh, actually, um, as you mentioned, my mother homeschooled me and my younger brother. And we, um, uh, we, we did a curriculum that uh, focused on uh, reading and writing and uh, mathematics. And um, the math, of course, we had a textbook that we, we did from, but in terms of our language studies, reading and writing, that was almost uh, exclusively through Srila Prabhupada's books. And the system that my mother used was uh, quite um, straightforward, actually. Um, it wasn't really with a curriculum, uh, but basically we would sit together in a circle uh, the three of us, my mother and my father was at work uh, during this time, but my mother would be there and my my younger brother and myself, and we'd sit in a circle and um, 
we would each read a translation from Srimad Bhagavatam. So we would begin with a chapter and we'd each read translations and we would read through um, the chapter and then we would um, discuss. Uh, uh, we would raise, uh, the kids would raise questions, my mother would raise questions. We would try to apply it into, in, um, in, in what our experience is of the world. Uh, and it, I, I remember it being so much fun and so interesting, such a good exercise for the intelligence. Um, because especially when you're, you know, you're young and, 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 uh, and you're, you're entering adolescence, your intelligence is, is really hungry for a lot of, um, to make sense of the world around us. And this, this just came at the right time in terms of um, reading Bhagavatam. And, and we love the stories there, but also the, the, the subtleties of uh, philosophy and the characters and so on. So it was a very fun experience. In, in the process, we, we picked up so much uh, good English vocabulary and um, uh, uh, reading skills. Uh, the, the, the English and Srila Prabhupada books is so um, uh, advanced. It's, it's really um, quite, quite challenging. Uh, some of the words that uh, we often read regularly, like uh, ecstatic or transcendental or whatever, this is not part of the average person's vocabulary. Uh, but um, but just by reading Prabhupada's books, your critical thinking skills and reasoning skills and and uh, uh, vocabulary and grammar and comprehension, all of these things become really really sharp, very good. Already, also your ability for abstract thinking, and these are the things they're looking for in in the academic world when a student goes off to the university to study. This is, these are the skills they want, right? So, um, you know, entering the university, uh, it, it wasn't a challenge uh, on, on the intellectual level because we had been studying these books. So. That's, that's so wonderful. I mean, just your own uh, story is basically a glorification of Prabhupada's you know, like that, uh, and, and I, I like how you said that, you know, and this as a young boys like you were studying together with your younger brother right and and you said that the intelligence is hungry at that time so i mean imagine to you know be fed with Prabhupada's, you know uh, wisdom at such a young age um yeah it's a very um very fortunate the way you you grew up i think many of us would would uh, love to have such an upbringing mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah thank you for sharing that's amazing now um not everyone is so fortunate. So many of us come later to Krishna consciousness and then we start to read Prabhupada's books. Maybe we can start with just some general uh, understanding of why is it important to read? I mean, you already answered some by explaining your story, but just um, what would you tell about this? Why is it so important to also daily, um, regularly uh, dive into Prabhupada's purports and understanding Prabhupada's books deeper? Um, well, let me let me answer this question. Uh, I continuing on the thread uh, before yep. from the perspective of children and youth, um, because I think many of our listeners there will be will be married and will have already have children or maybe planning for children in the future. And and let me just say that that um, the benefits of reading Srila Prabhupada's books, especially Srimad Bhagavatam, because the Bhagavatam is naturally attractive to, to children and to youth. Um, it has stories, it has Leela in it, um, but also lots of philosophy. And, and um, the, 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 by reading Srimad Bhagavatam together as a family, uh, many things happen uh, at the same time. The, the, the first benefit is that our family grows closer together. Uh, we... When we sit and we we talk and discuss and think together, it, it's um, it's uh, it, it's quite a uh, um, a unifying experience. We share our thoughts, we reveal our hearts, and we have the type of conversations that parents are always craving to have with their children. Right? This is one of the <clears throat> principles of parenting that we hear quite regularly: is the idea that that you have to talk to your children, see where they're at, um, what's on in their mind. And this becomes especially youthful, you, you, uh, useful and important when they become youth and they become teenagers. 
And, and this is a natural way to do it. You sit your child down and say, okay, tell me what's on your mind. They may or may not speak, but by reading Bhagavatam together, everyone's sharing, everyone's sharing what's on their mind and heart. And this draws a family together in the best uh, possible way. The family is drawn uh, closer together as a result of studying Prabhupada's books. Um, but then the second thing that happens is that um, uh, the children benefit academically. And, and what I mean by this is that um, Srila Prabhupada's books do several things. Uh, they, they're uh, academically speaking. Number one, they're um, uh, written in very high quality, very advanced English or whatever language it is that we're reading those books in. Um, I, I know BBT translators do a phenomenal job in terms of, in terms of translating Prabhupada's books into very, very good quality language. Um, and so uh, uh, by just by reading Prabhupada's books regularly, children's reading abilities, which is the most important marker of future success in academics for a child, is the, the level of their reading and the level of their math. Um, this is uh, around the world. These are considered markers of academic success. And, and um, children's reading abilities just skyrocket. They're reading at college level, university level, by the age of 10 or 11 or 12. Um, and, and this is, you know, it's it, their vocabulary. I remember as, as a child, uh, we were, um, my parents used to run Govinda's restaurant in Boise. And we would uh, help out there. Um, you know, we would uh, uh, pick up plates and, 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 and wash dishes and take money from the cash register, but most importantly, introduce people to the food. And on the side, there was a bookshelf. Uh, if people were interested in looking at some of Prabhupada's books, they were welcome to uh, browse and read even while they were eating. Um, and I remember someone showed up there uh, to have a look at the books. And whenever that would happen, my brother and I would be very eager to go there and tell them about the books. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went there and I was explaining to these two women about the books and, and what's in them. And I remember at one point, one of the women turned to the other and said, his vocabulary, did you hear what the words he's using? <laughs> and, and it was the first time in my life, I don't know, maybe I was, uh, I don't know, 10 or 11 or something. It was the first time in my life that it occurred to me that these words that we use on a regular basis, this is not, this is not common to, to most people. But, but beyond the language itself, the reasoning capacities that you get, I mean, think, think about this. We, the average devotee, even the average devotee child, is used to talking about Krishna's three energies, right? The material energy, the marginal energy, and the spiritual energy. Now, the, I, what's the material energy? Well, it's the world around us. Everything around us is the the idea of identifying the world as energy, right? And to think in an abstract way about the nature of the world and its transformations um, as the energy emanating from a source. This is abstract thought that the average person doesn't do until they enter the university or, or late high school stage, right? Or Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. The, the idea that there can be three aspects of divinity. So the capacity for abstract reasoning is, is, is something that you gain from regular reading of Srila Prabhupada's books. Um, but also, uh, besides abstract reading, uh, logical argumentation. Uh, Prabhupada's uh, writings are full of arguments, arguments against Mayavadis, arguments against atheistic scientific perspectives, arguments for uh, a particular um, idea uh, within the Bhagavatam's philosophy. This saturates Prabhupada's books. He's, he loves good argumentation and he does it often. And, and this institutes a type of logic and reasoning, again, that is very valuable uh, for academic success of a, of a child. Um, <clears throat> at the use of analogies and metaphors, uh, I don't know if this is still the case anymore, but it used to be that the college entrance examination in the United States uh, called the SAT exam, a big section of that was analogies. And uh, this was the most um, 
uh, well, not, I don't know if it's the most, but it was one of the dreaded aspects of the exam by most students um, where you would be given two things. If this is like this, then this would be, and then you have to fill in the fourth item. Yeah. A, analogical reasoning, metaphorical reasoning is a very valuable intellectual skill. Now think about this. How many times have you reading any scripture, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Chaitamrita, run into analogies, right? It is practically every other verse. Mm -hmm. the, the, the mind of the sage is like a, a lamp in a windless place. A, a, it's like a clear pond of water that is still. There's so many beautiful examples are there. And um, so, so abstract reasoning, argumentation, analogical or metaphorical reasoning, vocabulary and language skills, all of these things are embedded in Prabhupada's books. And when we read them regularly with our children, we, we, um, the, the, the kids gain all that uh, academic ability and skill so that they succeed uh, wherever they go, uh, where, whatever their future careers might be. Now, everything I've said so far touches, says nothing about the spiritual value of Prabhupada's books, right? I mean, I've spoken about how it brings the family together, and I've talked about how it, it, it increases our, our, the, our children's and our own academic skills of thinking and reasoning. This is all the side effects from Prabhupada's books, right? The main purpose of those books is to build good character to um, uh, uh, recover our relationship with Krishna, to develop bhakti. These are the main purposes of those books. And of course, they do those in excellent ways. Um, so many parents are worried about discipline with their children. Um, how do we keep them, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, cultivate qualities like respect and, 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 and uh, good character and morality and ethics and, but but uh, the thing is, the best way to do that is to give them good models, uh, uh, to teaching them and saying this is what you should be doing, is is um, marginally effective. Uh, but when we when we um, uh, allow them to enter the world of Shrimad Bhagavatam, when we allow them to enter this world of Prabhupada's books, where they encounter such wonderful role models, like. Um, like uh, um, uh, Prahlad and Dhruva and, and, and such um, wonderful stories and, and complex uh, situations that they're faced with, by right? difficult situations. It's not easy to stand up to, to, to your father or to stand up to, to the king, right? All of these boys are, are so uh, wonderful in their qualities. They, they really, they see... Um, how one can be, and that character rubs off on them. That, those qualities they rub off on on that uh, on them. So, so it's it's on all these levels. Uh, reading Prabhupada's books is is of huge benefit to uh, families and to our children, and of course to their parents as well. Thank you so much for highlighting that. I think this is the first time a speaker. You know, emphasizes that part of you know, like, and it's it's very good because, as you said, many listeners will be uh, griastas and having children. So I, I'm grateful, and of course, you're speaking of your own realizations because that's how you brought up. And I think we can all, um, you know, feel your uh, love for the Bhagavatam also in your words. That's that's very beautiful. Um, okay, like, of course, when we when we study uh, Prabhupada's books. And then also in our in ISKCON, we have this uh, Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vai the systematic study of Prabhupada's books. And there also we have similar to academic, I mean, in some ways, <laughs> we try to have some, you know, um, aims of studies. And um, there's different aims. And one of them is this Shastra Chakshu, seeing the world with the eyes of scriptures. <laughs> and um, yeah, I was wondering your experience, especially being, you before you mentioned the word like, entering into the world of the Bhagavatam and, and you entered into that world very young and then you cultivated that and, and also now in your academic uh, work you, you have written about the Bhagavatam so being so much absorbed in the Bhagavatam 
um, how does it change the way we see the world? And, and uh, maybe you like to share some realizations on, on, on that aspect of reading, because that's one of the benefits or results of reading also. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, um, y y uh, any, any psychological or social situation that we encounter in the world, we can find in Shimon Bhagavatam. Uh, when we talk about Shastra Chakshu, right, it's, it's sometimes we're thinking only in terms of um, this is what the Bhagavatam says, now I have to put that on, and then I have to look at the world through Bhagavatam. But, but I, I want to emphasize the other side of that, which is not just that we have to take Bhagavatam into the world, but really the world is found in Srimad Bhagavatam. Whatever we're encountering in the world, whatever situation we're facing, challenges, difficulties, happy moments, those are all relationship issues. Those are all exemplified in Srimad Bhagavatam in all these different ways and in very complex ways. Um, what, what are, sometimes when we, when we look at um, accounts from the scriptures, we think we, we, we um, simplify them. Uh, we we sanitize them into into like moral stories or value stories, right? This is uh, what does the story of Dhruva teach us? It teaches us to be determined, even when we're young, and therefore you should be determined. And what does Prahlad teach us? Right? It teaches us to be tolerant, and therefore you should be tolerant. And this is this is uh, this is our our the moral. So we often take um, lilas from Bhagavatam or from the scriptures. And we simplify them into, um, you know, a single moral story, as if it's a fairy tale. And here's the moral at the end, like Aesop's fables, right? But, but these, these are not fairy tales. They're not moral stories. They're embedded, of course, with a lot of morality and ethics. But, but they're stories about the real people and the real world. And the real world is a very complex world. It's a very um, uh, challenging place that is complicated and is messy. And when we study Bhagavatam in all its richness, we, we study them directly uh, rather than you know, giving our children or ourselves uh, very uh, simplified versions of the stories. When we read Bhagavatam directly, those verses, what is being said, we find that there is um, all this richness there that exactly um, 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 it, it exemplifies what's happening in the world outside, right? Now, now think, of, think of the story of, of Dhruva, for example. Yes, it's, it teaches determination. But if we look at the complexity of the story right from the beginning, um, he, he's, when he's rejected by his um, father, uh, right, he wants to climb on the on the lap of his father, and his father ignores him. And his stepmother stands up and says, "You don't have a right to sit on your father's lap." Um, this this burns him not only because of his stepmother's bad language and her hurtful words. I'm sure Dhruva has heard those words before, words like that. You know, this he's grown up with his stepbrother uh, um, Uttama, and so. He, it can't be a surprise, but what is especially painful for him, and Bhagavatam describes this, is the fact that his father remains silent in the situation, right? And, and doesn't stand up to be who a father is meant to be. Now, later on, Uttanapad uh, regrets this greatly, and he recognizes his mistake. But right away, we see a, um, a break in a relationship between father and son that unfortunately, sadly, is not unusual in our world today, right? So many people struggle with their relationship with their parents, and particularly that father-son relationship. And, 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 then, and then his rejection from the lap of his father is also not just about the personal relationship. There's another issue there. When, his, when, when uh, Suruchi says, you cannot climb onto the lap of your father, she is saying something additional than just the father-son relationship. She's saying, you do not deserve the throne, right? You're not heir to the throne, even though he's the eldest son. And he comes from his chief queen. He's the child of the chief queen. Still, you will not get this throne. So it's a double whammy. It's political and it's personal. 
both. And, and then he goes to his mother in tears and shaking and trembling and angry. And his mother hears this story and she's, um, she herself becomes overwhelmed with emotion and, and, uh, and, and, and sadness um, hearing what Suruchi said and what her husband did not do. And she tells uh, Dhruva, she says that um, I, I am nothing more, I, I'm not even a maidservant in this home. Uh, my, your father pref- uh, completely neglects me, right? So she's she's someone who has felt the burning that Dhruva feels now. She's felt it probably much of her life, right? The entire relationship of being neglected in the king's court, of being neglected at home again and again and again. But but now her pain has just doubled. Namely, there is nothing worse than for a mother to see her child in that pain. Now, because of her and her relationship with her husband, because of her low status in in the palace, her son is now suffering for the first time. He's encountered something. And and we cannot imagine Suniti's pain at this point. She's, Bhagavatam described that she's crying these hot tears and, and just burning with pain to see her son suffer so much. But despite that, and this is the amazing thing about Suniti, is that despite that, she has the intelligence and the courage. She doesn't lose her intelligence in this moment. And she, she is Krishna conscious enough to tell her son, look, my boy, anger is not going to get you anywhere. You need to take that anger and you need to channel it into something positive. And I am so sorry to tell you, but your stepmother is right. The only way you are going to be able to get what you want is by approaching the Supreme Lord. That's that's going to be your only hope. I mean, the courage it takes, the intelligence it takes in that situation, instead of lashing out and telling your son, okay, my son, this is your lifelong goal. You got to get even, get revenge. From your brother, stepbrother, let's we're gonna fight now. You've grown up, and one day when you grow up, we're gonna do instead of instead of complaining and venting and and plotting a, a, a creating a plot for revenge. She has she is intelligent enough. She is Krishna conscious enough to turn around and tell her son, "You're going to have to eat this bitter medicine. Go to the forest and worship Lord Narayan." She has the courage to send her five year old boy into the forest. How many mothers would have that kind of courage, right? So we, we, see, we see in this story, we see something very complex, right? We see a complex dynamic of a broken home, of a tough relationship between fathers and sons and mothers and stepmothers. We see a child who has a completely natural reaction of anger in a situation where he's been insulted. And we see a mother who has a completely unnatural, totally Krishna conscious reaction to the situation, unnatural in a material sense, Krishna conscious reaction to the situation and tells her to, tells her son to go uh, to worship Krishna, right? So what I mean to say is, is this is, this is just the first, you know, chapter of that multi-chapter story. And already it's so deep and complex. And you can see so many people's experience in that story, right? So if we want to see the world with the eyes of Shastra, we need to see the world in Shastra, right? If if we want to see the, the world with the eyes of Shastra, we have to see the world in Shastra. When we read it, we have to read it as it is with depth. And we have to hear what's there. Not just the big point that everyone tells us, but every verse, everything I just described is there in the verses. It's describing everyone's emotions and everyone's nature and relationship. It's all there, right? And if we read it carefully, we see the complexity in the text itself, then we can see, we can look out into the world and we can apply Bhagavatam in our own experience in the world. Thank you. That's beautifully explained. And that was just, as you said, it was just one chapter, one part of, there's so many stories 
there's so many exchanges between all the different characters in the Bhagavatam. We could, you know, give so many other examples. So, but yeah, I think it's a very um, a valid point that to 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 see how these are true person that, that's like real life that we can yeah. you know see from the Bhagavatam and, and naturally it has something to do with us because we also go through similar experiences. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Prabhupada said so many times that these are not fairy tales, right? Mm -hmm. And and this is what it means. If it's not fairy tales, then what is it? It's it's a depiction of reality. Yeah. It's a depiction of reality, both material reality and spiritual reality, transcendent reality. It shows us what is and what is possible, both. Yeah, yeah and it's interesting also to see because most of these are very elevated personalities, kings and mm. queens and demigods, but they also have envy, they also have lust and greed and anger. So, yeah, <laughs> if they have these issues, then what to speak about us? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, um, let us maybe talk a little bit about Srila Prabhupada in, in the sense of his unique contribution with, with his Bhaktivedanta purports. Because, I mean, you're a scholar and, and we have also written on the Bhagavatam. So naturally, you must have studied many commentaries and, and, and of course, you're reading many books. Um, so what would you say is, is the unique contribution of the Bhaktivedanta purports? And maybe also, how do we... Um, realize or, or get ex entrance into Prabhupada's presence in his books. Mm -hmm. We know Prabhupada is there in his books, but how to enter. But these two points, maybe we can touch a little bit. Yes, yes. Uh, wonderful questions, Prabhu. Actually, um, uh, you, you know, uh, in, in, um, uh, in the Bhaktivedanta purports, what Prabhupada is giving us, and in his translations also, what he's giving us is quite extraordinary. It's unparalleled. Um, and again, I want to give the example of one of his books, namely Srimad Bhagavatam, his, his magnum opus. Uh, if, if we look at the Srimad Bhagavatam just from a historical perspective, and, and I've got a, a full seminar on this topic called Glories of Srimad Bhagavatam. But if we look at it just in brief, from an academic perspective, the Bhagavatam is amongst the Puranas, amongst Sanskrit scripture, is unparalleled for many reasons. It it, it's the, voc the Sanskrit, the quality of the Sanskrit vocabulary and the difficulty of its grammar is among the most difficult in, um, uh, 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 in, in Sanskrit scripture um, and, and, and hands down amongst the Puranas. Um, the Bhagavatam is a combination of um, uh, poetry and uh, literature along with philosophy. And very few books actually do both. There's a lot of books of literature and poetry, but very few about, you know, philosophy that also combine philosophy. Books of philosophy typically don't have story in them, right? So Bhagavatam does both at the same time. Um, it also has one of the most um, uh, prolific commentarial traditions uh, in Sanskrit literature. It, we know of about 90 commentaries on Srimad Bhagavatam that existed at some point or another. Um, and not all of them st we still have access to, uh, but but uh, th there's dozens and dozens of commentaries all across the Indian subcontinent from every uh, sampradaya and every perspective. Um, uh, they're 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 there, and of course the Gaudiya Vaishnav commentaries on Bhagavatam are amazing. They're phenomenal. So it's actually um, among Sanskrit scholars. Uh, it's often said that uh, uh, Prabhupada also quotes this line: "Vidya Bhagavata." Vid Bhagavatavadri, um, um, that uh, the, the, the limit of knowledge, of Sanskrit knowledge, is found in Bhagavatam. That's the test of someone's learning, is if they're able to translate and explain um, Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. So what Prabhupada gave us in his translations and purports is, is quite extraordinary. Um, he took this tradition of um, one of the, the most um, difficult Sanskrit works and one of the most widely commented upon Sanskrit works. And he distills that and provides it in language that is accessible to us, right? So the English language is the most widely spoken language in the world, but then he instructed his followers to translate it into everyone's languages. 
so that that knowledge, which was accessible only to the best of Sanskrit scholars, that was the limit, the test of their learning, is now accessible to anyone who speaks any language, right? So he's made that knowledge accessible. He's, in his purports, he's distilled the wisdom from the Gaudiya Vaishnava commentaries over the generations and provided that into his purports. And this is something I've experienced many times uh, in, you know, part of my work is I sometimes, uh, uh, I, I'm investigating into different commentaries and looking for how Acharyas of the past have discussed this particular verse or issue. Uh, and then I, I write about it. So I, uh, it's always interesting to me to say, oh, this is, this is wonderful what Jiva Goswami says here, what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says here. Let me go back and see what Prabhupada says here. And sure enough, Srila Prabhupada distills the key points from each of these Acharya's commentaries and provides them in our Bhaktivedanta reports. And then, and then finally, then he takes that knowledge and he applies it in, uh, to a modern context, right? He, he provides, he takes their examples. Um, when Jiva Goswami talks about uh, how the, the body and the soul are, are uh, um, they're, they're, the, the body is not independent. It's dead matter. The soul is what activates it. Uh, he gives the example of an ax and a woodcutter. The ax cuts the tree, but it cannot cut independently. It's only the instrument in the woodcutter's hand. Now, when you read Prabhupada's purport on that, uh, on the same verse, instead of the ax and woodcutter, he gives the example of the car and driver, right? <laughs> that Prabhupada's famous example, that the car cannot drive itself. It looks like it's driving on its own, but there's some human being, some person who's inspiring it behind it, right? So Prabhupada, I mean, how many of us have, a, have uh, experience with axes and woodcutters? No one does anymore. Right? Not everywhere they're using chainsaws and bulldozers. So we don't have this experience. So Prabhupada is taking it and he's, he's applying it. He's updating it in a way that makes sense to our experience. Mm -hmm. So in, in all these ways, these three ways, I would say, he, he, he makes it accessible by putting it in a language that we can understand, namely English or any other contemporary language, instead of being locked away in Sanskrit. The second thing he does is he distills the essence of um, the entire tradition of commentaries within the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. And the third thing he does is he then applies it to a modern context. Any one of these three things, Prabhu, would have been praiseworthy on its own, right? If someone, if he had just translated it would have been amazingly praiseworthy, um, an extraordinary contribution. If he had just, um, uh, if he had just uh, uh, gave us, if he had just given us the commentaries of the previous acharyas, that would have been a phenomenal contribution. If he would have just applied it in a modern context, that in itself would have been amazing. The fact that he does all three in his translations and purports, that is. Uh, unprecedented. It's really um, quite amazing, right? So that's that's how I see, you know, Prabhupada's contribution. Um, having studied his books, but also studied kind of the the history and the academic hist the historical side of these books uh, in the past. It's it's really the more you study, the more you recognize just what a um, historic thing that Prabhupada did in giving us these books. And also Prabhupada was speaking, dictating. That's also, an, you know, usually a writer takes so much time to rewrite and edit everything, but Prabhupada just spoke. That's also yes. very yes. unique. Yeah. Yes. yeah, beautiful, beautiful glorification on Prabhupada, basically with, with uh, sharing your thoughts. Um, yeah, the second part of the question, in, in a sense, was of how to, uh, I mean, the author, naturally, I think that's, true for every book you know like if you read a book somehow associate with the author of the book because the author has you know expressed his inner heart and his his thoughts um now naturally when we read Prabhupada's books we we get a chance to associate with him um any thoughts on that uh like how as a devotees we can really um feel Prabhupada's presence while reading his books 
what, what what is the proper like attitude that we should have or any realization on that mm. yes um yes Prabhu, thank you for reminding me about the second uh, part of the question um actually um each of us as devotees can and should have a a personal relationship with Srila Prabhupada um, through his books. I I remember um, as a child, once I was speaking to Ganapati Swami. Uh, he's a wonderful devotee who would visit us um, for each year in Boise, Idaho, a sannyasi and uh, Srila Prabhupada's disciple. And um, he would he would come to Boise twice a year. Um, for a week each time. And I remember one time, uh, you know, uh, telling him or reflecting, uh, saying, uh, Marge, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so um, uh, unfortunate that I wasn't there when Srila Prabhupada was there, uh, that it would have been so nice to, to, to be with him. And, and these devotees, his disciples are so lucky. And Maharaj looked at him and he said, he, me and he said, he said, I, I didn't get much personal association with Prabhupada, not like some of the other devotees. He said, but by reading Prabhupada's books, we can have an entirely personal connection with him. We can see him as we would talk face to face. And for me, that, that's, that instruction, that reminder, that statement early on from Ganapati Maharaj was really powerful because I thought, uh, I... They're, 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 this is the nature of parampara. This is what parampara means. That future generations don't have any less of an opportunity to connect with Guru and Krishna than any later generations, uh, any earlier generations, right? That each, in fact, later generations sometimes have more of an opportunity to connect because they have all these wonderful acharyas who are representing the same truth again and again and again uh, through fresh realizations and fresh application. So with, with Srila Prabhupada's books, um, we can have an entirely personal relationship with him and see him as a person speaking through his books. And I think this is a, a valuable thing as we read Prabhupada's books to, when we, we read them, to remember always that this is Prabhupada talking directly to me. We are sitting in the same room He's on the Vyasasana, I'm on the floor, and he's talking to me. And what is he trying to tell me? Not this is what Prabhupada wrote, you know, 50 years ago, and now let me, you know, try to figure it out. No, this is, he, he's speaking this right now, in this moment, and he's talking to me. And if we do that, then we come to recognize that these books, they talk to us. I've had this experience many times in my life, that the Shastras are not dead. They're, they're, they're living, right? They're manifestations of Krishna himself. And Prabhupada's purports are Srila Prabhupada directly showing us Krishna. He's saying, look, here he is. He's opening the curtains for us. He's giving us darshan, right? This is like darshanarti in the morning, shingarati, govinda, madhi purusha. This happens in Prabhupada's books. His purports are basically, he's opening the curtains for us. He's singing the govindam prayers and he's saying, this is who Krishna is. You can come see him. You can come meet him. So, my my spiritual master um, Hanumat Preshaka Swami, he says something very um, wonderful that I want to share with you. Um, he says in in Vrindavan, uh, every Brajbasi, every Gopi, every coward boy um, is a good citizen of Nanda Maharaj's kingdom. Okay, they do. They, they, their job is to milk the cow or to go sell, sell the milk in Mathura or whatever their role is. Um, every gopi is a good citizen in Nanda Maharaj's kingdom. At the same time, every gopi, every coward boy is, um, has a, a personal community, a personal group of devotees who are like-minded with whom they share their realization. So when the gopis are glorifying Krishna, they're glorifying amongst themselves in a way that they can all appreciate, right? That maybe the coward boys won't appreciate because their rasa is different with Krishna. So you have your own circle of devotees amongst whom they share. And then every Rajbasi has a personal relationship with Krishna. That is all their own, right? That's Krishna 
and them and they understand and they feel, why is Krishna being so kind and loving towards me? Why does he treat me so special? What do I do to deserve it? Every coward boy thinks that, that, that Krishna is his best friend. Right? So they're citizens in Nanda Mahaja's kingdom. They have their circle of devotees and they have their personal relationship with Krishna. So also in uh, our life as devotees, Maharaj says that we have to be good citizens of Srila Prabhupada's movement. We have to be good citizens in ISKCON. We have to do our role. We have to do our seva. We have to keep our temple president happy. And, you know, we have to participate and contribute to the community. And then within that, we should have our own circle of friends and like-minded devotees who share in our seva and with whom we can discuss and reveal our minds. Tushyanti cha ramanti cha, bodhayanta paraspara, right? As Krishna says in the Gita. Um, and then we have to each have our individual personal relationship with Srila Prabhupada. And that relationship with Srila Prabhupada is created through his books, right? It's produced through his books. But by studying his books regularly, we have an individual personal relationship with Srila Prabhupada. Now, here's the thing. All three of these layers are crucial in a devotee's life because occasionally one layer might take a hit, right? One layer can become a little bit uh, wobbly or fractured. Maybe we've had some negative institutional experience and something happened in the movement and we're not, uh, we, we don't feel good about it. But we have our circle of devotee friends uh, it, whom we share our, and we can rely upon them to keep our Krishna consciousness alive. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, or, or sometimes our faith in, in, the, uh, in the circle of devotees uh, may be a little bit wobbly. Maybe our friends have let us down or you know, we've lost that circle or we move away to a different town or something. Then the broader society of ISKCON will help support us. We go to the local temple and we you know, make new friends. Um, but through all of this, our relationship with Prabhupada's books is the foundation, right? It's the cornerstone that we know if everything else collapses in our life, we can recover our faith just by diving deeply into Prabhupada's books. So on all these levels, uh, it's very important. And even I should say that sometimes people struggle with Prabhupada's books. Sometimes uh, they, for some time, they may lose a little taste or they encounter some difficult statement that they can't quite appreciate. Well, who do we re rely on in those circumstances? We go to our circle of devotees, right? We expand out our circle of like-minded devotee friends with whom we can we, we do seva regularly together and we can rely upon them. So each one of these layers, they, they work with each other. They, they support each other to keep faith alive because faith is something that is very fragile and right? it's very delicate and it has multiple pieces. And sometimes one part of faith will wobble or it'll fracture. And then the other parts can help support it. This is why the study of Prabhupada's books is so crucial. And that personal relationship with Prabhupada is so crucial. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's a, a powerful and beautiful uh, uh, way to look at it. And, and, and so true yeah, for all of us. I'm afraid that our time is running out. Uh, <laughs> I still have many questions. Um, maybe you could just um, address point of um, if you like to share a few thoughts on uh, how to help devotees with uh, overcoming some obstacle in reading or some good good advices on how to study um, you know especially you have been studying your whole life and, and you know that's your daily bread we can say so um, what would you advise devotees who maybe sometimes feel a bit um, not so enthusiastic about reading yes um so, so, you know, uh, the mind is such that it will always trick us into different reasons for not doing what we should be doing. And so, um, and, and, and I have the same problem. Uh, uh, my, my mind is, is, is very fickle. Um, and so, so what, one thing that, that uh, I, I like to do that helps me a lot in terms of um, ensuring that I study regularly is to find, uh, um, to, to create uh, situations or obligations that that um, that that require me to study, right? So, for example, you're asked to give a class, right? 
So you, you, or you sign up to give a class. If there's invitation to give, then you find a reason you, you sign up and, and choose a, choose a section that you haven't, um, or ask them to suggest a section, please suggest some, some verse or some section I need to, to uh, speak on. And they suggest a section that you have not read for a while or maybe never. Right. <laughs> so you have to then read, you, you have to speak on one verse for Bhagavatam class, but to understand it, you need to read what came before and what comes after to give a proper class. So in this way, you have to study. Um, if you're in, in the university or you're in school and you have an assignment to do, find an assignment, uh, a topic that you will uh, require you to go back and study something from Prabhupada's books, right? Um, if, if you're uh, in, uh, in family and you have to spend family time together, then uh, husband and wife can, can set up a, uh, a time every evening where they read one verse from Bhagavatam or Gita together to discuss and to appreciate. This is a wonderful way for husband and wife to spend time together. You have to spend time anyway for a good relationship. So you do it like this. So, so in other words, um, find ways where you cannot escape. Uh, force yourself. Rec- create a situation where you have to, uh, that it's not, it's, not, it's not an option anymore. That way you always keep up some connection with Prabhupada books, no matter how busy you are. Right, and create obligations that you have to meet around Shila Prabhupada's books. The other thing I'll mention is that um, sometimes it's very, um, just in terms of a reading technique, it's very nice to read the translations first only in a chapter so you understand the broader story and the context and what's going on, and then come back and read the purports, uh, the translations and the purports. Uh, so- and, and that helps for us to see the detail point and the broader uh, context. And when we understand the broader context, it keeps us inspired, it keeps us going. Um, so, so that's something else. Another thing that's very useful for those who have read Prabhupada's books for some years to keep up um, taste in them and to be inspired is to do a thematic study, uh, find some topic, right? Like um, recently I did a thematic study of, of uh, Bhagavatam's, um, what the Bhagavatam has to say on ecology and the environment. Mm-hmm. And so I went through and studied, you know, the Bhumi Gita in, in the 12th canto and the story of the Prachetas and their burning of the trees and, <laughs> and, and the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, 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 Maharaj Prithu chasing the earth with arrows uh, and, and her speech, very beautiful speech where she talks about what she does to maintain all the creatures of this world. And she petitions Maharaj Prithu as, as Bhumi Devi. Um, Bhumi Devi's prayers to Lord Vishnu when she goes with the, the, the demigods uh, mm-hmm. for protection, right? When Hiranyakashipu is to- tormenting the world. So I, I, I looked for all these sections and read those sections. And it was so much fun. And in the end, I, I wrote a little article uh, that was published in the Iskand Communications Journal mm-hmm. on, on the Bhagavatam's uh, theology of uh, environment, on its eco-theology. So... It's nice to just, and you don't have to publish, you don't have to write it, but just choose a theme um, that is relevant, maybe in, in, at work or at the university or someplace, something that you've been thinking about, talking with your friends about, and then do a thematic study of the books. And it's really interesting, very exciting. And you recognize, wow, there's all these resources to, for Shastra Chakshu, to see the world through the eyes of scripture. Mm. So those, those are a few techniques that I, I like to use. Very, very pragmatic, very practical. Uh, yeah, wonderful. It has been such a great pleasure to hear from you. I think you brought so many um, very valuable points, very practical, intelligently, beautifully presented. Uh, it was wonderful. Do we have any final statement, final words to our viewers um, that you would sh- like to share with us to end with? Yeah, I, I, I'll just say that... that um... That I think, um, you know, uh, regular study of Srila Prabhupada's books is something that um, will transform every aspect of our life. Uh, and we, 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 we sometimes we don't recognize the effects of it immediately, or we, we, we think, oh, uh, you know, if I, I don't have the time to do it because there's so many other things and so on. But my experience has been that if we make the time to study Prabhupada's books, 
everything else in our life is easier, it's smoother, it's more inspiring, we can be more focused, nothing else suffers. It's not a zero sum game uh, like the material world is. You know, if you do one thing, then you then everything else suffers. If you focus on one thing, everything else goes down the drain. Prabhupada's books are not like that. When we when we study Sri Prabhupada's books, everything else in our life doesn't suffer. It becomes better. We become more successful in everything else. And so I I think I think that's that's how we have to recognize as an investment in studying Prabhupada's books, that Krishna, Krishna will never penalize us. He will never um, punish us for studying Srimad Bhagavatam or studying <laughs> Bhagavad Gita, right? Why would he do something like that? He wants us to come closer to him. When we take the time and the energy to study these wonderful scriptures that the Lord himself has given us and that Prabhupada has shared with us, then Krishna is so pleased that he ensures that we get that time back mm. twice or three times as mm. much by making everything else in our life wonderful and beautiful. So I just want to end with, with that to, as a point of encouragement. <laughs> Thank you so much. You have really given us a lot of um, wonderful gems of, of wisdom and knowledge. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for this opportunity, Krishna Premarupu. I really appreciated the opportunity to talk to you today. Most welcome. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama.